<laughs> Thank Go. you. Welcome again to the Joint Northwest Central and Coastal San Pedro uh, Neighborhood Council <laughs> for Planning and Land Use um, committees. And um, we have representatives here from uh, all three councils. And um, I see Diana Navis from Northwest, myself from Central, and um, Robin Rudisil, and don't see her yet, but um, I see there's committee members from that council as well. So thank you and welcome. Um, we're gonna get started um, with our first item of the agenda, which is um, update from Altice and Terry Tamanen, Tamanen is here to let us know about the status of the project. Well, thanks very much for the invitation. And uh, I probably stand between all of you and dinner on a holiday week, so I'll be brief uh, and, and definitely answer any questions if there are any. First of all, let me just make sure, does everybody know what Alta-C is? Do I need to go into any brief background at all? Or is everyone at least familiar with Alta-C? I think we're all pretty familiar. And, and we've had updates from time to time. So most people have heard about Jason Woolley, who's new in town, may I don't know, Jason, how much you know, but the rest of us, I think, are pretty familiar. But I didn't know dinner was involved, so this is good. <laughs> <laughs> good luck with that. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, so so just first of all, by way of introduction, I'm Terry Tamanen, the president and CEO of Alta C. Coming up on my one-year anniversary, I started last year on January 1st, and uh, prior to that, I was secretary of the California Environmental Protection Agency and uh, worked with governments all over the world on climate solutions, especially in the blue economy, which is what Alta C does. So I was really pleased to be able to take on the assignment at Alta C when, um, when Tim McOsker decided to run for city council, and he's now the city council person representing that uh, area. So we have friends in high places. Uh, mm -hmm. In any event, uh, so the past year has been very exciting. And again, perhaps for Jason, or just as a reminder for others, Alta C is a nonprofit where the Port of Los Angeles has essentially given over 35 acres of what was city dock number one, so the oldest warehouses in the port, 100-year-old warehouses, uh, and about 16, 15, 16 acres of land that used to be a tank farm that has yet to be cleaned up. But on our parcel, uh, if you're familiar with Signal Street that runs down the length of our peninsula from north to south, uh, right there, uh, pointing at Angel's Gate, so we're very close to the open ocean. We, uh, on the west side of the campus, have 250,000 square feet of 100-year-old warehouses, which, uh, as I mentioned, the port dedicated that to us as long as we raised the money to renovate them into a modern blue economy and education center. And uh, pleased to tell you that in the last uh, 14, 15 months, we have been able to raise uh, well over $20 million. We're starting renovation of those warehouse. Well, we've actually already started. We put a brand new roof on so that that would accommodate our two megawatts of solar, which are going on. Um, and the solar panels have been delivered and the transformers and the wiring, and it's all very exciting. They're gonna start putting the panels up there uh, the first week of January and uh, the whole thing will be done by March 15th. So we'll have some kind of a ribbon cutting Governor Schwarzenegger actually wants to participate in this because one of the reasons that project got done was our Million Solar Roofs Initiative that we put together when I was in government with him. So we'll have to <laughs> draw some attention to this, um, but we'll be producing enough energy for 700 homes. So we'll be a net exporter of that energy. And then the uh, core and shell, the, the electrical and plumbing and bathrooms and all of that renovation begins um, uh, let's say the 1st of February, our bid package is out right now to uh, four contractors. We had eight contractors competing for the business. We shortlisted the four, uh, what we figured were the best contractors. They will then give us their pricing um, January 15th, and we'll have a couple of weeks to choose the finalist and then negotiate the, uh, the final contract uh, for them to start in February. It's about a 10 month uh, renovation schedule. So it's gonna happen pretty quickly. We have, uh, for those of you that may know the birth numbers, uh, 180,000 square feet of our 250,000 on that West Campus are birth 58, 59 and 60, each is, is 60,000 square feet. And they're buttressed right up against one another. So it's essentially one building. That's what we've put the new roof on and the solar. And we have emptied out 58 and 60 so that we can uh, renovate those first, 
then in about uh, eight, nine months, we'll move all of our current tenants from 59 into 58 and 60, and then we'll renovate 59. So that within about uh, 15, 16 months from now, we will have all 180,000 square feet renovated with modern electrical and, and infrastructure. And we have quite a few tenants on the approach path in addition to the ones that are there that uh, at this point, I would say we are, are fully leased. Um, and the kinds of tenants that we have attracted, I think if you've been there recently or, or any time in the last year, you will have seen the U University of Southern California Kelp Lab. They have about 50 tanks, 500-gallon uh, tanks of bubbling seawater with different strains of kelp where they're experimenting uh, with the species that will be more resilient to climate change, to do kelp farming offshore and onshore. Uh, to be able to extract food and fuel and pharmaceuticals and things like industrial colorants from seaweed. So really exciting technology companies will be spun out from that research. One on site already, um, Hold Fast, which is uh, uh, developing new techniques of growing mussels and oysters and clams and other kind of seafood. Uh, and then again, there'll be a lot of these different companies working with the seaweed. There's one called Spira that has already spun out that uh, is doing the pharmaceuticals, as I mentioned, and the industrial colorants. So we're working with uh, a number of uh, aquaculture companies. Pacific Six uh, has a brand new vessel, which just arrived last week, uh, that is an automated harvesting vessel. So they go out, there's a 100 acre demonstration farm, which Alta C uh, has part of, that uh, is about six miles off uh, San Pedro. And there it's basically buoys in the water with ropes and the kelp or the mussels grow on these ropes. And then the boat goes out there when they get to the right size and strips them off and reseeds them and puts the ropes back in the water. So you can grow these, these different things in these farms in a very industrial way, but in a very sustainable way. Um, and then, uh, so we, one of our three pillar areas at Alta Sea is aquaculture. The second one is renewable energy. We have four wave energy companies at uh, Alta Sea. You've heard a lot, I'm sure, about offshore wind energy, but uh, wave energy is even more reliable and abundant. So these companies will be demonstrating their technologies and trying to get locations uh, set up, uh, but having a place to showcase the technology and demonstrate it and, and perfect it uh, at Alta Sea. We also have researchers there from uh, University of California at Los Angeles, UCLA, that are perfecting different ways of extracting carbon from seawater. So you've probably heard of direct air capture, where one of the solutions to climate change is to take the carbon pollution out of the air. But it takes a lot of energy and a lot of cost to do that. So unless there's a three or $400 a ton price on carbon emissions, which right now there isn't, um, it's kind of not economical to do direct air capture. But you can pull carbon out of seawater. Think about it, seawater is so much more dense than air. You get much more carbon out of the seawater for every volume that you're processing than if that was air. And the byproduct of the ocean carbon capture project is hydrogen. And so that's something that can be sold, which helps to subsidize uh, this technology and make it more viable, both as a climate solution, but also as a business, a sustainable source of energy from the ocean. And we're doing a lot with hydrogen uh, on that note. We know that uh, there's lots of Teslas and electric cars running around, but uh, we really need to decarbonize the highly polluting uh, cargo handlers in the ports, the tugboats, uh, various other kinds of, you know, the trucks, obviously the heavy duty sector that uh, has to decarbonize very quickly because the ports are on deadlines of 2030 and 2035, where thousands of those container handlers that never leave the port, just move the containers around and so on, are all running on diesel and they have to uh, be zero emission in the next few years. Well, you can't do that with batteries because it takes too long to recharge the equipment, so it has to be offline. And uh, DWP can't get enough power into the port to electrify all the terminals, let alone all of those vehicles. So the only way to electrify those is with hydrogen fuel cells and refueling these, these uh, uh, pieces of equipment with hydrogen. So we're going to create a hydrogen demonstration center for that purpose at uh, at Alta Sea so that these companies can come showcase their 
uh, marine oriented technologies to help clean up the air and, and decarbonize shipping. And then the, thir the third large area that we focus on is uh, underwater robotics and, and other blue technology to understand our planet better. Many of you may know Bob Ballard, who found the Titanic. He keeps his vessel, the Nautilus, in port with us when he's not out working and rebuild or builds his robots. And he teaches it to high school students, which is really very cool. They learn propulsion and, and uh, buoyancy and so on and build their own little robots and test them off of our wharf. Many of them are still at the bottom of the ocean, I'm sure. But, <laughs> but he, uh, he he's very good with the students. And that's part of our other mission, of course, as you know, is, is education, K through 12, and workforce development, where we want these kids to learn that there are jobs in each one of these sectors I'm mentioning. And uh, so in addition to, uh, to three underwater robotics companies that are already calling home uh, at Alta Sea, and Bob Ballard, as I mentioned, his Ocean Exploration Trust, Jim Cameron, the film producer and, and director of Avatar, He's also, as you may know, an undersea, deep sea explorer, and he's gone to the bottom of the Mariana Trench, the deepest uh, part of the of the ocean uh, on, on planet Earth. And uh, he has got a submarine that was specially built. He designed it, tested it out all over the world. It's an amazing uh, piece of equipment. He's going to bring that to Alta Sea toward the end of next year uh, with an exhibit of, of all of his findings and then partner with Bob Ballard, uh, the two of them work together on Titanic, on the movie. Uh, Jim's re-releasing Titanic next year uh, because of the 25-year anniversary, so enhancing the, the imagery and so on. And so there'll be a lot of buzz around that, and all of this Titanic memorabilia will be at Alta Sea for a public display and to engage young people in undersea exploration, along also with the Tongva, who uh, have been building their uh, historical and traditional canoes, the Tiat as they call it. And they're gonna be bringing one of their Tiats to Alta Sea for this exhibit, but also they got a grant to teach this carpentry practice, these ancient carpentry practices to the next generation. They'll be doing that at Alta Sea as part of this exhibit. And you'll be able to operate your own little underwater drone as part of this exhibit. So that'll be fun. Uh, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife is already a tenant. They're gonna be moving most of their enforcement and research divisions into Alta C when we finish our, our construction, although they already are there. So uh, anyway, as I said, uh, I'll, I'll wrap this up here. I know it's kind of a long winded and I dumped a lot at you, but we're very excited by the fact that we've raised this funding to get the renovation done here now and fill up uh, the warehouses um, and, uh, and fulfill our mission of education, workforce development and business incubation. Um, and of course, uh, helping with the, the blue economy um, on the whole West Campus. And then we'll start turning our attention to the East Campus. So happy to answer any questions or provide any other context. Thanks, Terry. Very interesting information. And um, I've been following now to see, and every time I hear more, more interested, I get into what you guys do there. So thank you very much. Um, we have a question from Rock, short comment. Hey, Terry, good to see you. We saw you at the chamber and I toured Alta to Sea a little several weeks ago. And we'd love to have you come do something at our place at some time. But uh, people keep asking me because in the many Alta to Sea things we've talked about, we hear about the university. So what what's the status of that? The plans going forward for that? Sure. So uh, the University of Southern California is already a, a tenant, as I mentioned, with our kelp lab and Dr. Neustadt's kelp lab. Um, and two other researchers uh, are going to be locating through uh, through USC at all to see when we finish building out. One does 3D printing of concrete. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen 3D printing, usually plastic or little things. Well, they do 3D printing in concrete of uh, breakwaters and other infrastructure for uh, for the marine environment. So they're going to be demonstrating that and researching that. They also have a biofuels uh, researcher that will be locating, uh, being able to make uh, uh, biofuels uh, from uh, algae and, and other uh, ocean sources. Uh, so they'll be taking quite a bit of space. And then UCLA, as I mentioned, is uh, on site now building out their research for this carbon capture project. We have some work to do. Um, the UC schools have a slightly different standard for 
uh, what their students can occupy in terms of seismic. And because the whole port, as you know, is built on fill, you know, there wasn't land there originally, uh, there's some constraints there, but we're working around that as part of our next phase of, of renovation. But wherever they can locate in uh, with trailers or outdoor areas or on barges like this, like this carbon capture project, uh, they have a presence. And then, of course, we're working with our community colleges in the workforce development programs and the Southern California Marine Institute uh, is working to have what they would call their West Campus. So if you know where SCMI is on Terminal Island, they're going to keep that but they've outgrown it. So they're gonna share lab space with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and other researchers on our site and have some of their programs over on our site and bring the boat over there as well because when they do field trips with kids, they have no parking over there. They have nowhere to brief the kids and debrief the kids when they go on and off the ship. So they're going to start doing a lot of their field trips from all to sea as well. So all of those uh, partnerships are, are continuing and growing. Thanks. Thank you. Alan, do you have a question? Um, more in the nature of a comment, I'd like to thank uh, our guest for his presentation, which I thought was excellent, and for bringing his experience and expertise to our community and the, the roster of issues that uh, you plan to address is, is quite impressive. For, for a lot of people, I think in San Pedro, it's been a long haul, uh, great expectations early on for this project and uh, slow realization of, of what we perceive as its potential, uh, both for our community and for the contributions it can make to the wider world. So uh, it, it sounds from your presentation like we, we are much closer to uh, achieving something close to 100% of the expectations that we had set for So thank you again. My pleasure. Yeah. I invite you all to come down and see it at any time. Uh, we have our regular open houses if you subscribe to our little newsletter, but also at any time you're welcome to come down and see it. I'd be happy to show you around that we're already fulfilling that promise. We've got K through 12 education. We did about, I want to say about 8,000 kids last year. Uh, we've got these workforce development programs already going on with a certificate program in aquaculture and a new one coming up on uh, underwater robotics. And uh, uh, and then, of course, the businesses that are already there, as I mentioned, that we're incubating. So we have, you know, we're certainly not at 100 percent yet, but with the funding and the renovation, we will get there very soon. Thank you. Uh, Pat, do you have a comment? I have a couple of questions. Uh, can you hear me OK? Yeah. Uh, one is, what is your synergy with the uh, Rio Marine uh, the Aquarium? Um, how do you interact with them? And the other is, it's uh, the port sometimes talks about um, its relationship with the Southern California job market and the uh, uh, United States job market and so on. What do you what do you think of the uh, multiplier effect of, of what you're doing uh, down at the Alta Sea is on the local community? Yeah, um, so the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium, we love them. Uh, we sort of have a handshake. We don't do live animals and and any kind of displays like that or hands-on uh, with live animals. Um, and, uh, and they're not incubating the blue economy. So we each stay in our lane, but we table when they have public events. We send our folks over there to table when we have our quarterly open houses. They send uh, uh, people over, volunteers to table. So each of us, you know, shares knowledge and and uh the public with the other to make sure everybody understands and it's a i, I wish we were closer together because it's really the perfect one-two punch you know you can see what's happening in the ocean with with the uh, and the, the critters and and what it is that we we have here in the coast and and the animals and so forth it's just amazing to be at the aquarium as you know and then you come over to us and you can see well are there jobs and to your point yes um there was a study that was done by the LA Economic Development Corporation, and I'll get the number wrong, but it was something in the effect of, uh, uh, they've identified 187,000 potential blue economy jobs uh, before the end of the decade, uh, if we build out this these, these uh, economies and job training programs. So it's, it's very tangible, and I think it's a, a very big growth industry. 
Peyton, you had a comment. Jason, you're muted. Uh, yeah, we can hear you. You're talking to the air. <laughs> Is it working that, now? Yes. Yeah. This computer has two microphones. It seems to always select the wrong one. So. Um, Terry, thank you very much for the presentation. We're very excited that this project is really starting to, to get some steam here. Uh, I'm curious, when you were talking about some of your farming projects, are you familiar with greenwaves.org at all? I don't think so. So they're, uh, they're uh, based on the East Coast. They've been around for maybe 10, 12 years, maybe longer. Um, kind of like they're trying to do a similar thing. It's a nonprofit <laughs> where they are trying to train uh, ocean farming, small farms, small farmers, offshore ocean farming, um, sound very similar, hanging the strings down, they're farming kelp and mussels, you know, in um, uh, co-beneficial uh, environment situations. And I was wondering if you had it spoken to them, because it sounds like what you're talking about is very similar to what they're doing on the East Coast, and um, there might be some synergy there. There could be, and I'll check. Uh, we have what we call our blue concept to commerce, blue C to C program and that's the actual incubator that works with the companies and works with uh, like-minded institutions to share knowledge other blue tech incubators around the world uh, and uh, so I'll check with Portia to see if she's interacted with them um, and we are however trying to share our knowledge there is a port in Kearney New Jersey which is right outside Newark which also has old hundred year old warehouses that were used by the Navy in the wars that have a very similar history to ours and uh, um, the owner of those facilities in the port has joined our board recently, Wendy New, and she uh, uh, is a great philanthropist. She's made a major donation to Alta C, and we are training her staff to basically recreate Alta C in New Jersey, but with local species of fish, kelp, aquaculture, local opportunities for wave energy and the kinds of things we're exploring. Uh, and so forth. Um, uh, Sandra Whitehouse, the great oceanographer who wrote our kind of reason uh, to exist paper, you know, what were the theories that we should be focusing on? What are the strategies we should be focusing on? She's writing a similar analysis for them. So we are bi-coastal already. We've also had interest from Rio de Janeiro, where they also have an old port with facilities, and we're helping them do the same thing in Rio. So it's a model that uh, is very exportable and, and can help the whole world. Okay, thank you very much. Very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, th th I'll, I'll add my thanks too. And uh, it's, it's really exciting to see it get to this point. Um, I want to say I saw the demonstration on the 3D concrete. It was really interesting. I was really glad I got the chance to go over and, and, and see what they were doing. Um, I was interested because there's also the potential for 3D concrete housing and which is a very cheap way to build housing. And uh, so I wanted to see what it looked like. Um, I had a couple of questions. The first one had to do with your timeline. You, you know, you talked about when you were going to start construction. But you kind of didn't talk about when the build out would be complete and we'd start seeing these tenants that you're mentioning being able to move in. And the second question, I know you were in line as a finalist for some big grant. I, think, I can't remember, was LAEDC or somebody else was the partner on it. Um, I'm assuming that didn't happen, but maybe it's still not decided. What's yeah, that grant, no, that grant went to Fresno. It was a competitive thing. And uh, I think, yeah. to be honest, they were probably focusing, the government was focusing on a more underserved community. Um, but uh, but anyway, uh, other grants, we've gotten uh, $18 million from the state uh, since I joined. We've gotten you know quite a few other major donors. Corporations now are starting to discover us. So I think we're in much better financial shape than than ever, and as a result, we're able to to move forward. And I'm sorry, what was the first part of your question? Well, I had to at the timeline. You you talked about oh, yeah. when you start construction, right. but not the kind of the end of it. Right. So so fortunately, because this is uh, mostly core and shell work, um, that's uh, it. It takes about ten months. So and then for the first two warehouses to be done, and then as I mentioned, we'll move out of fifty nine because we already have a lot of these companies there. I mean, this is not the future; it's already happening now. We're bursting at the seams, uh, and we're going to be playing musical chairs. So within uh, let's say eighteen months, because everything takes longer than you think, the builders are telling us fourteen. But let's just say eighteen months from now, the whole thing will be done. But uh, the first two will be done before the end of next year. The first two sixty thousand square foot warehouses. 
and our current tenants will then be able to move into that fully renovated space in that timeline. Great, thank you. Just exciting. Thanks, Diana. Um, I don't see any further comments or questions for you, Terry, but we really thank you for taking the time and um, letting us know what all exciting things are happening there. So we really look forward to seeing more of it and uh, we appreciate your time. Well, thanks for your support and for all the good work that you do to make our communities better and look forward to getting to know all of you better and, and coming back and reporting not only progress, but how we can work together. So thanks very much for what you do and ha happy, healthy holidays. And at Thank any you. point, if you Thank have you, things that you feel would be good to work together on, just reach out to us. We Don't wait. You bet. Wait. You you bet. To reach out. Thank thanks you. so much. Thank thanks you. Lot. Thank you. Thank you. Very well. Uh, we will move on to our next item on the agenda, which is um, the Pacific Avenue beautification plan and what the next steps will be. Yeah, and I need to figure out how to share my screen here. Um, here um, what do I need to do here? I can't figure out how to do it. How to get, how to get, okay. There's no shared screen at the bottom. No, 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 I can't get to my desktop. Just, just oh, I see. The there you there you go. Go. Got it. Your hand can't be there. Mm -hmm. We're talking about this one. Okay. Um, I'm screen sharing. Oh, my. It's there. Yeah. How much are you seeing? Are you seeing just the letter? And, and, um, yeah. Most of uh, it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's got the whole there. thing, including the CC at the bottom. So, okay, so um, I know Central prepared a, the, Ziggy brought this up several meetings ago in terms of doing some beautification of Pacific. And then Central prepared a letter um, and then Northwest, it came to Northwest and we revised it and added some additional information. One of the things we did at, at Pat's suggestion was to add things that would make some of it eligible potentially for port funding. So there's several references to the port um, in the letter. Um, in addition to that, we added a request to the council office that they would assign a staff person to work with us, both in developing a plan and to help us identify um, potential resources for its implementation. And we're going to send the letter not only to McOsker, but also to the port with copies to the bid and the chamber. And um, you know, Central's already done their letter, but I'm, I'm suggesting that Coastal may want to consider um, something as well. Beyond that, the, um, in terms of, of next steps, the, I've been in discussion with the um, chamber and the bid. We know the bid has some money that could be used for some improvements on Pacific. Um, and also with uh, Mona and Leslie, because they're already doing a lot of work along Pacific. And we have identified um, February 4th, which is a Saturday morning, as an opportunity for all of us, anyone who wants to join, to walk a portion of Pacific Avenue and really look very specifically, like address by address, block by block, what improvements we think might be needed, and then to begin to talk about how to approach them. Some of them may be things that the city could do, some of them may be things the bid could do. Some of them may be things we want to go back to the port on, different city departments. Um, it may be that, that there's some things that are identified that Central says, oh, well, we can step up and put a little bit of money into this. Um, but that's the idea is to come on and talk about, figure out what, what specifically needs to be done. Um, so we're going to meet um, on Saturday the 4th at 10 a.m. at Sirens to uh, take that walk and then figure out after that kind of how we proceed from there. So that's my report on that. No, I think that sounds like a really good idea. Um, and definitely walking the the avenue is gonna help us identify things. I, I think, you know, there's segments of each block that have different needs, particularly like the downtown area is one. And then beyond that on either end, it's, it's a different need. So. Um, definitely will be helpful. 
No. Uh, let's see, Siggy, you have a comment. Yeah, um, I'm happy to report that since I brought that up, uh, I think it was like two months ago, um, the Tivoli lighting has been extended to yes. to uh, down to Third Street, I believe. So I was really happy to see that. And it looks great. It looks great. And uh, I cannot join on February 4th because that is the weekend of my film festival. <laughs> Oh, sorry. I will not be able to join you. I'd love to join you guys. Yeah. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, any um, any other comments or questions in regards to that? Or any other thoughts about follow-up that anyone else has? Um, Alan. I would just point out that uh, the, the weather forecast for the 4th is rain, so we may all end up in the theater watching the film festival. <laughs> That's a, no, we're talking about the 4th of February, Alan. Oh. 4th of February. Oh. February 4th, not January 4th. Ah. He's an optimist. <laughs> I was going to say, you're looking way far into the future, Alan. Supposed to rain tomorrow, too, if it's not. Uh, Saturday, Diane, Saturday, and at what time? At 10 a.m. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. Very good. Very and good. Yolanda and Elise have already both committed to, to, to joining us. Great. Excellent. Well, I'm sure we'll and post it. Is committed. I'm sure we'll post it so that anybody interested can, can join us. So and this draft letter, if, if Coastal's interested, is in tonight's agenda packet. Great, and we have ours uh, from Central ready um, for the next uh, board meeting, which is in January. Very good. Um, if there's no further comments discussion. We'll move on to the next item, Diana. Next item, is the next item the letter for the grocery store? So uh, we, we have a consideration for a letter regarding the need for a grocery store in downtown San Pedro. Dylan? And Dylan isn't here, is he? I don't see him. I didn't see him and he didn't respond when I asked him if he had a draft letter ready. So maybe they're out of town and we need to put that over to the next meeting. We'll do, we'll, we'll move on to the next item then. Um, so. Item number five is um, an activity plan comment. Item five is um, comments on the connectivity plan. The um, Northwest Planning Committee have drafted a letter to the consultants on the connectivity plan, outlining some of our expectations for that plan. Um, the letter really incorporated the issues that we raised at our last joint committee meeting and many of the ideas that were raised when we were originally um, considering this as a part of the PAIP. And so I just wanted to share the letter and encourage both Central and Coastal that you may want to look at uh, doing similar letters. I understand that the consultants um, will be beginning the public process in late January. So this is this is the letter and it's in, in tonight's uh, agenda packet. Yeah, Central has adopted um, revised version of the, the same letter. Um, oh, okay. And we we are ready to present that at the board meeting as well to send out. Um, you guys did an excellent job on that, by the way. Um, somebody was asking us if you guys had a planner <laughs> in staff because there's really good points made and uh, a lot of good information. So thank you for that, Diana, and, and your group. Well, it's really everyone's work. As I said, a lot of it was stuff that came up back when we did the public meeting that we did to gather input into the PIP. And so I just went back and reviewed all of that to, um, to incorporate it in here. Yeah, no, it's it's great. So we we will present uh, Central's letter um, coming month, and hopefully they'll get it right before they get started um, as well. So thank you, Diane, and everybody. It's great stuff. 
Just don't be modest, Diane. <laughs> what? Don't be modest. You, you it's, part of her, it's part of her work, you know. <laughs> Comprehensive and inclusive. Good job. Thank you. Yes, very, very good. Um, okay, if there's no further comments on that, we'll move on to our next item. Um, item six is um, a need for traffic enforcement, and this is citywide. Um, we've talked about it in the past. Um, um, the current situation is very dangerous, and uh, as Mr. Franz can testify, he's already had a running with the problems of people not following the traffic rules and it just seems like you know people feel like nobody's gonna enforce anything so they don't need to do anything and um i mean i i, I just can't <laughs> say how critical this will be because every day i drive through town and it's like almost a close call in every intersection so um i don't know if you had any uh, particular aspect you want to talk about it diana well, I did talk to our new councilman about it. And first thing I learned is it is a problem all over CD15. There's a lot of people that are concerned. Um, I also talked to somebody from um, Harbor Gateway North who was having very similar concerns. Tim said that he had, you know, he would, he'd been concerned about it too. And he contacted the police department to see what could be done. And the message he got basically was that there is a lack of sufficient staffing to really enforce and they're putting their emphasis more on other things that maybe they aren't putting enough emphasis on on this because they've been pulled in so many different directions um one thought that i had was that well i guess i have a couple of thoughts one we may want to put all this into a letter just to put down the the, the kinds of, of issues that we've seen but the other is that we may want to ask our our budget reps to advocate for increased funding for staff for traffic enforcement and also for parking enforcement, which has been another um, issue that people have raised. Um, so that was just one thought I had on it. I, I said we'd put it on the agenda tonight for discussion and see what else people come up with. Yeah, I, I, I agree on both, um, particularly the parking enforcement. It's another one that uh, until recently, nobody was even coming around. Um, I, I get a permit for the lot behind 7th Street, and half of the time I can't park there because there's way too many people. So, um, Craig, you had a comment. Um, I, when we went into this in the last meeting, I, I, I spoke because I, I attended many CPAB meetings, and there's been a constant, uh, you know, of flow on you know parking and not parking enforcement but um traffic enforcement. traffic enforcement and they basically say oh we'll call the traffic officer down and nothing happens i think you know when we're talking about where they you know it's not traffic enforcement is not sexy um and I don't think that's where they want to put their efforts. But I think that in terms of safety for all of us, um, in term, I mean, my house was never broken into when uh, the traffic officers were parking out in front of it, trying to pe catch people going through our stop sign. Um, and that, you know, and just, Two weeks ago, my neighbor catty corner from me home was broken into. Um, there's definitely we need to tell we need to be telling the police department that they need to put a better emphasis here, that it makes us safer, mm -hmm. not just during the day, but at night also, because a lot of the things I mean, I have I sit on a corner where there are uh it's a three-way stop there is no fourth way and i can sit out there and watch people all day long running those stop signs as i can on 
They just put one on the bottom of the hill from me. And um, I'm sure that gets run all the time because it's in an inappropriate place, but they decided to put it there. The real, what we need to do is to stress to the police department that um, they need to put bigger emphasis on traffic control as a way of uh, uh, safeguarding the community, not just from traffic problems, but from uh, other uh, problems that would occur that if they knew people were watching. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Linda, you had a comment. Yeah, I I think that you know the response is going to be we don't have the money and we can't afford the staff. So probably in addition to just you know reminding them that we're concerned is uh, work through the budget advocates to um, you know do they actually need I guess they have to have actual police officers to do traffic control, but. Uh, to to say we want more money. Well, we I think most of us want more police in the area. But uh, I think, you know, it's a two prong. We've got to start poking at the budget advocates to see if they can, you know, what did the police already get with the biggest budget in the city already. But, but that's, you know, that's what they're going to say. They don't have the staff. No. Brock? Yeah, it's a normal reaction because about four years ago, the neighborhood council, we had people drafting things about telling them how to use chokeholds and not use chokeholds and all this other kind of stuff. And the question was, we should tell them what, how we could help them and how they could help us and where to emphasize things. And I would pull parking out of this totally. That's another issue. And again, every time an issue comes up, parking comes into it. We're talking about enforcing, like a lot of issues out there, enforcing the laws that are there. I rolled down, you've heard me say this down seven, I got someone who came out of an alley blind. I mean, almost ran into me. I was run into six weeks ago and it's ridiculous. And I, I just, there's gotta be people, whether they're sitting on the corner or strategically there to catch people to enforce the law. Just not, okay, I'm sitting here one day and you're not going to come by. And so the emphasis needs to be there because this goes into, Craig, I absolutely agree with you. Um, you know, it prevents, you know, theft and everything else. It prevents people from going crazy. This is something exponential. It, it, it prevents increasing insurance rates and all this other kind of stuff. If you have issues in San Pedro, all our rates are going to go up. It's a financial issue outside of a safety issue and a civil issue. And we need to somehow hammer on this in the most effective way and just be vocal about it. Thanks, Rock. Um, Siggy? Thank you. Um, I'm just gonna say this from a layman's point of view because I don't really know how the police operate. <laughs> However, I'm always surprised when there's 10 cars with sirens blaring or more going down Pacific Avenue to go to some incident that I'm sure didn't require 12 people. So I don't know. I don't know if anyone can explain that <laughs> from the police. <laughs> and yet, you know, and yet they don't have the staff. So how come they have the staff when it's, you know, one person and there's 12 police, police officers? I think it's a little bit over the top, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. Chuck. I'll check you muted. You're muted. Um, I put 35 years on a police department. And the explanation is this. Recruitment is down. Minor crimes are not first call you go to. When it comes to offer officer safety, like the call you were just talking about, when you don't know what kind of a call it really was, it could be someone being in danger of being killed. And when that happens, policemen roll. And when they're going to think that policemen are going to get in trouble, if a man has a gun 
and only one or two cars are responding, that doesn't work. You're gonna save that policeman's life because then you'll have one policeman doing 30 or 40 things less on his shift. So it's all very important. It's not the police. The leadership of the police department recently is talking against traffic stops, unless you have something more to go on, like a suspicion activity, a license plate that's bad, or uh, you may think it's a, it's a stolen vehicle, or anyway, they're very limited on what they can do with the numbers they have. And serious crimes come first. Protecting your life and property comes first. That's, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Uh, and the recruiting issue is this also. No one wants to join a police department anymore, anywhere, no matter what city you're in, because you don't get any backing from the politicians. The politicians are all elected. The, the higher echelon of police departments are usually voted in now by the uh, city councils and so forth. It used to be promoted from within, which meant the police officer, the street guy, the sergeant, the lieutenant knew who would be best for the upper echelon. That's not the case anymore. Upper echelon does not, they don't get there by doing police work. They get there by doing studying the books and going to college. That's kind of it in a nutshell. You know, you don't have active enforcement unless it's really basically a matter of life and death of, of protecting property. Traffic is second nature. I'm sorry to let you know that, but that's the truth. Thanks, Chuck. Dan? A bleak but realistic assessment from Chuck. I want to just bring it a little back, bit back into the neighborhood. I concur with Craig that one fairly uh, straightforward way to look at this is that uh, the degree of visibility of police officers can enhance people's <laughs> ability to act lawfully, I think. Um, I think having one way to achieve that is through traffic enforcement, humble, unsexy, but life-saving traffic enforcement. Uh, repeatedly over the last many years, we've asked LAPD to enhance uh, watching traffic issues at a particular intersection or in a section of town. And uh, frequently the report is that that works. And I think it has the added benefit of, again, putting the police out into the public so people see they're doing their job and that they're making a difference. And in fact, it does make a difference. So I just think, uh, I, I concur with Craig. Let's try to um, ask for enhanced enforcement when we see particular issues, like people blowing through a, a stop signs at an intersection. That's one that where you can place an officer for an afternoon That's and true. probably make a difference. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Ron? Yeah, I always wonder what the DET meant, and I imagine it stands for detective. So thank you for your service, and I, I just wanted to make sure. I don't think anybody's trying to impugn uh, uh, our men in blue and, and women in blue and all that other kind of stuff, because I'm sure they have orders, and that I totally agree with what you said. But um, I think maybe our job is also Oops, you froze, Rock. Mm. That in the you're freezing. You're gonna have to back up back up what you're saying because you froze in the middle of it. It's okay. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> okay, Doug. Yeah, it's cold here, but I'm not freezing. Um, <laughs> so okay, I I had I, I apologize because I had to actually go attend another meeting for 15 or 20 minutes and now I'm back and I get the gist of this. So this morning I drove my daughter from our house by the corner store to Sirens to go to work at 830 
And let's see, I think I only saw about three cars who ran stop signs, but there wasn't much traffic. Um, I actually think the simple solution is just to add the word suggested on all <laughs> stop signs. Um, because that's the way most people tend to, tend to take them. You know, one of the things we have to realize is it's not as easy as going to LAPD and saying we want more traffic enforcement. The way this, the department is structured, there is a separate traffic division with traffic bureaus and we're South Bureau traffic, which has its own station and everything up on Venice Boulevard. And so when we once the blue moon see officers, you know, particularly on motorcycles writing tickets, you know, that's when we get our quarterly share. And it's very rare. So, you know, if you're going to go talk to budget advocates or city council member or whatever, specifically say we want more traffic officers, mm -hmm. not just we want more cops. Um, Chuck's right about, you know, part of the recruiting problem. I would also point out that anybody who goes to apply for a job as a police officer in LA, you're looking at at minimum of nine months to be hired. That's where we are in the city. It's ridiculous. My daughter is at the top of the list to be a librarian. That goes back a year. She's still waiting to be hired. I mean, that's the personnel department in the city is an utter mess. Um, I don't know what our new mayor is going to do about it, but it really impacts. It's not that there aren't positions for officers. It's that they're not hiring anybody. It's not that there aren't people who are applying. They're just taking a ridiculous amount of time to hire. That's something I think we should all be looking into. There are hundreds of unfilled positions in departments all over the city, including LAPD. Why aren't people being hired? They're going on lists. They're qualified to be hired but nobody's actually hiring them. So that's something that we should be looking at. But in terms of traffic, I'll tell you right now, you know, we've been fighting like hell down here to try and get some sort of safer crossing for individuals from Joe Milky Flores Park uh, at Paseo Del Mar. I mean, I can't tell you how many times we've had pedestrians running across there, particularly at night, there are no lights there. Uh, there's no safe crossing there, but what we understand is it's not going to be an enforcement situation. We have to create some sort of traffic calming, better lighted, safer crossing infrastructure. I mean, that's just what we're going to have to do because we're not going to be able to have the enforcement. But my recommendation, go after budgeting, go after particularly looking at traffic division, and go after hiring practices because that's what's killing us here. It's taken forever to get people into these vacant positions. So that's my two cents. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. Pat? I think uh, we could probably solve the city's budget deficit and probably solve uh, running the stop sign uh, problem pretty easily if we just put cameras uh, on the stop signs. They just I'll put cameras. Yeah, I don't, I'm not in favor of that, having gotten a ticket up from one of those things, but I mean, that would that would uh, slow people down like crazy. Look, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, there were several traffic fatalities. Kids got killed. And I mean, uh, back when Janice Hahn was our council person, and boy, she went on a tear and she put um, traffic, uh, you know, stop signs everywhere. And then following administration followed it, followed it on. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, I don't want to raise that as a, a, a poor con, any of that, but boy, it, you know, if, if the word got out that there were some uh, traffic or hidden hidden cameras on some of these signs, like around uh, around town, the, the people would be stopping at, at the stop sign with regularity. And they're, they're expensive, they're expensive tickets too. That's it. Thanks, Pat. Uh, Jason. I, I spent some time driving around in uh, some countries in South America where they just definitely do not have enough police to monitor all the crazy traffic. And you know how they slow cars down? They put those speed bumps everywhere. You can't <laughs> go very far without a speed bump. It slows you down. I tell you what, you hit one of those too fast, it's going to destroy your car. So you slow down. 
So you want to slow down traffic and not have to have an expensive per hour policeman sitting there around watching it. You put some of those speed bumps in and they will slow down. I know I can't go over them very fast in my car without risking hurting the car. And so. then you then you have an unlivable community. I mean, they started putting up around here. I wouldn't want to live on a street with a speed bump. Um, not because I don't want them. I don't want to drive over them all the time. <laughs> you know, we just had uh, the traffic people come to the chamber and here and it was like they're not putting them in and they don't they're in the middle of the street. They're not at the stop sign or anything like that. I think it's such a lazy way to do what we need to do. So I wouldn't say throw out the baby with the bathwater. Do it correctly. Then put it at the stop sign. You can't run through a stoplight with a speed bump on it. You're going to stop. It's still a lazy way to do it. <laughs> lazy? More effective. Yeah, I think so. Well, you should be, you should be a traffic program, engineer for a while, just so you know. Even that program was... Um, Point of order, we're talking all over the place here. Can we have some control? Control? We're just having a conversation. Yes. Um, what I was going to say, the speed bump program is it's limited on the number of applications that I, they accept every year. And uh, the last time I tried, the uh, opening was closed almost immediately. So we didn't even have a chance to submit an application for that. So unfortunately, it's not as easy to do as um, as we would like it to be, whether we like it or not. But um, anyway, um, I almost think that traffic enforcement could fund itself by giving citations and uh, creating its own budget out of that. Um, we requested uh, police to be here at the intersection of 11th and Leland, and they've come out on occasions. And I would say that in a two hour period, they didn't stay still more than a, a, a couple of people by every time somebody crossed the intersections, they were going after them. So. Uh, that just tells you how typical that situation is. Uh, Pat. Uh, I've forgotten what we have on the uh, agenda that we're discussing. Are we discussing a letter or something like that? Yes, how we want to present this to... Um, Diana, you, you mentioned something about um, the council office? Well, I... I brought it up with the council office and okay well, if we got something on the table to talk about i would like to uh, suggest an amendment and put in some of the ideas that we've uh, heard we've heard some from doug we've heard some from uh chuck and uh, i would you know i'm gonna regret ever saying uh, that they should put cameras on stop signs but, but add that one in there too I think we're at a point of trying to find somebody who wants to write the, to draft a letter. We don't want to do a letter, but we need somebody to draft it. I'll be happy to do it. <laughs> was that how many should do it? Yeah, that was the problem. Yeah. Um, Someone should do it who's experiencing the problem, certain location. Yeah. Right. Uh, my my intersection has that problem. I almost got T-bone just a few days ago, so. Yeah. I can totally feel the problem. <laughs> I think it would be great, Javier, if you drafted the letter, but I've heard two or three other people talk about specific incidents and maybe they could send you a sentence regarding the, those examples as well. Um, and I wanna add in there that one of my concerns is the people that are basically running the red, red lights. When the lights change, people are not stopping when they should. And so what happens is you can't make a left-hand turn until you're sure that that person's not gonna run that light. And one of these days that's gonna be an accident for someone because of the way that people are running the, the red lights as well. Yeah. Um, I think it's great if you're willing to do that letter. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd be happy to get any um, comments or suggestions from anyone uh, in a particular problem area or incident and, and you know we could add it to the list. I don't know if for example it would be helpful to do sort of a like a street survey where we park for a short time and you know see how many people don't actually stop in a given time frame just to illustrate the point. Did you see Chuck's reaction to that? <laughs> yes. He said, yes, that's what we should do. 
Who said yes? Chuck. Yes, Chuck. <laughs> yes, that's what we should do. Okay, well, I mean, that could be one of the options. Well, let's, let's, let's put it on the agenda for next month then with a letter. Okay, sounds good. Somebody um, volunteering to do a street survey? If you want, I can. I my I have a camera that's looking right out at uh, the stop signs right in front of my house. There's three of them. I can show you. A, I could do a a study for over a week with the the backup I have to show you how my, how often those stop signs get run. It's hundreds of times a day. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think you know if if we could identify areas, particularly where there are schools and a lot of pedestrian activity. Uh, will make the case more um, obvious um, because that that's usually the biggest worry. I mean, I might have a better chance being hit on a car than being hit walking. So anyway, so, so, um, so I see sorry. there's some hands. Uh, okay. I'll start from left to right. Doug, you'd see. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say. If it'll help, I'll be happy to send the video of the car broadsiding me right outside Sirens because it's beautiful color video that from <laughs> Yolanda's camera. Um, you see me spin around. It was quite exciting. And a few months later, as I was crossing that street, somebody actually came through the stop sign, swerved around me as I was in the crosswalk and then discovered that the car behind them was a police car. Oh, <laughs> which which I joyfully watched pull them over and write them a ticket. Ah, nice. So I will tell you, there sometimes <laughs> is poetic justice. Oh, it does happen. <laughs> Let me tell you, a survey sounds nice, but I can point to probably five dozen intersections in any given month where I witness people run stop signs. I will tell you one of the new phenomenon that I have observed, and I don't know if anybody else has seen it, but at certain intersections such as uh, 7th and Pacific, you, if you will note, the walk signal lights up about four or five seconds before the light turns yeah. green. Yeah. I have now seen motorists go on the walk signal, Whoa. even though the light is still red. Hmm. It's a particular technique I've seen at least twice with people making left turns. The minute that walk signal goes, they make the left turn, even though it's red. That's potentially a huge problem, I think. Um, again, you know, people will adapt to these things. So I don't know, you know, if you're going to identify surveys, the first people I would talk to is DOT. They're out there, they're out doing traffic studies all the damn time. I mean, if I had to point to a single bad intersection, it would be 7th and Mesa, right outside Sirens, because only because I sit there most mornings watching everybody <laughs> run, run the stop signs. And I you, personally had a car totaled in that intersection. Well, um, you do a survey of, of, of an hour or two, how many stop signs you see getting run there? Oh, it's incredible. Absolutely you incredible. Can count them in but I would point color. out, all you have to do is get the video from Yolanda. It points right at that intersection. Watch an hour's worth of the video on any given busy day, and you'll be able to count the cars without having to go stand there. Um, so I would think about that. You might want to pick out one or two intersections in each area so that you don't have a huge long list. Um, but I would talk to DOT and I would say, have you guys got a list of the most problem intersections in San Pedro where at, uh, they keep track of accidents? That's how they determine where to put stop signs and signals. Um, right. I would ask them. Yeah. I would go do the research. I would talk to, I'd get somebody in from uh, South Bureau traffic and say, you know, if you guys go sit like, I don't know, on Paseo del Mar or Gaffey or Western or wherever they're at for, say, four hours. How many tickets are you writing? What are you writing tickets for? And would it be more productive if you had more people? Um, I would ask those kinds of questions of them to help shape something like this. And I would definitely, I think really importantly right now, 
hit city council, hit the council member and say, we need more traffic officers. It's, it's a huge deal. In terms of cameras, I mean, Pat, Diana, we've been to AXAC. We know that the, everywhere where there's a traffic light, there's a camera. There are mm -hmm. people in the base, sub basement at City Hall East looking at us run these stop signs, looking at us running these stoplights in a lot of places. So, you know, do they do anything with that in terms of enforcement? So, I yeah. mean, I think some more research would be helpful. Thanks, Doug. Um, Chuck. Uh, that, those are good ideas. Uh, but I, just give an example. We had a problem here in my track. It's at uh, Taper Avenue and Westmont. And uh, David Rivera, who lives right on the corner there, was monitoring it. Uh, but and he, he made a note of you know, the dangerous crossings for children and when school is let out. And we ended up getting a traffic officer there. Uh, it took a, it took a couple of couple of weeks, uh, but uh, we got one there by doing just that, uh, uh, identifying the, the problem legitimately, legitimately. And that's why I'm, when you talk about monitoring a uh, intersection, uh, and you're talking about stopping a full stop, your rolling stop, or actually violation. So. <laughs> Don't exaggerate. If it's a if it was something you cautiously roll through a stop sign, don't count those. Okay, <laughs> we're all guilty of rolling stops in some way or fashion. Mm -hmm. That's all I have. I'm sorry. No problem. Thanks, Craig. Okay. Well, I I think we're looking too closely. We're not. We're looking. You're trying to make a a micro answer for a macro problem. This is, uh, this is a problem of traffic enforcement on a, on a citywide level. We're, we're, we're saying we want you to put more resources into traffic enforcement because we think that makes us safer. Um, but what you're saying is, oh, well, you know, this is a seventh and and uh, Gaffey, you know, we need a light down there. We need enforcement down there. And so that's just, you know, a Band-Aid. We need to ask, you know, the police and traffic enforcement um, to, to do that. We think that this will inf cover us better. If we sit there and we just point out, oh, you know, you want to see one, one in front of my house? We all know all the stop signs get run. You want to go down Gaffey when, um, in the morning and watch people drive down the center divider, the center divider on there because they, they want to get to the freeway faster? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, and you think the police are out there to, um, and they know this is happening. You know, it's um, I've asked the police on numerous occasions, why do they never drive up on Capitol up above um, the Field of Dreams? And they, they say, oh, well, this, that, another thing, but they're never up there. The real problem is, you know, unless we sit, we push the the envelope and we say, hey, you know, we don't think this is working right for us. If we sit there and we talk about, you know, okay, let's get this thing on 7th and, 7th and Gaffey going, how's that going to help it? How's that going to change the situation? How is that going to get us tra traffic enforcement that improved? It's not. It's just going to put a Band-Aid on it. You know, could I could I ask that we could wrap this? We're just chatting here, like a. Oh, the question. That's <laughs> not. You're out of order. We exhausted this topic and auto auto um. Yes, I I, I think we'll we'll make a motion to write up a letter and uh, prepare something that we can pass on to the um, uh, right department at the city and the council's office. And, Javier, can I say something real quick? Yes, Rock. 
I just real quick, I think some of these anecdotal things are good for the bulk of the thing. Yes, I don't think a list of intersections, it's a, it's a citywide deal. And so, and it's not just, oh, put stop lights and whatever. That's not the answer. I agree with you, Craig. They're sort of not gimmicks, not the word, but the band-aids or whatever. But it's like, we need more emphasis on this and enforcement that knowing people can be caught. And I think, and we know that this all got worse during the pandemic and that type of stuff. But I know I live right above the high school and I talked to a cop 10 years ago and he goes, oh, I need to be near the school. But at 17th and Able, they're just racing blind through the top of the hill. So squeaky wheel gets the grease. So that's all. Um, and now one last. So can we move on? Let, oh, Dan. I was going to let Dan and that was going to wrap it up. Thank you. I, I think that all of the things we're talking about are important in, in looking at this matter. It is global, but we are a neighborhood council and it's very local as well. I think monitoring uh, uh, people's uh, Zoom, ca their cameras on their homes and stuff. That is a good idea. It's rather theatrical, but it's a way to present evidence to the city. This is the budget time of year downtown. If we're gonna ask for more money from departments or anybody, this is the time to do it. But I just wanna point out one thing. The unintended consequence of stop signs and traffic control in general. One problem that I'm hearing here, and I know I suffer from it myself, is if I come to an intersection and there's a stop sign, that gives me a sense that there's some control over the intersection. And unfortunately, it's incumbent on every driver to make 100% sure that, you're, that the car that you're looking at as it approaches the intersection perpendicular to you is not gonna run the stop sign. It's, it's um, it's, it's one of those things when Janice kept putting in stop signs, everybody said she's pulling them out of her trunk and putting them in where she wants them. And frankly, the unintended consequence of that was scoff lying and, and, and objecting to her approach to improve traffic. So listen, it's global, it's local. This needs to be looked at by all of us in every direction, because it is a huge local issue. It's a quality of life issue that involves life itself. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Totally agree with you. Um, very well. Um, so Diana, then we would present something at the further meeting and um, um, have a statement to right. present officially. And people should send you whatever thoughts they have to incorporate. Okay, very well. So. Anybody has any suggestions, ideas, feel free to send them to me, please. And we'll put something together. Um, I'm sure we're not the only part of town that has a problem, but it sure feels like that when we drive around town that it gets really bad here. So anyway, thank you for the time. Um, we're gonna move on and our next item is updates and other items of interest to the committees. Okay. Um, first, I just wanted to share with you something in your, uh, your packet tonight, which is a list of the housing that is actually currently under construction in downtown San Pedro. So the first part shows the different affordable and transitional housing that's currently under construction. And then the second part is um, market rate homes that have low income um, units uh, included with them. What's not in this list are any of the projects that haven't broken ground yet that are still going through the approval process. They may be approved, but they haven't started doing anything. And it also doesn't include Ponta Vista because this was just aimed at downtown and I had it. So I just thought I would share it um, with you all. And it's in the agenda packet if you um, want to, to see it. Um, do, 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 do. So, the um, couple specific updates on housing. Um, Beacon's Landing is coming along rapidly. You should drive by and take a look at it. Uh, 89 of the units will be available to those who've experienced homelessness. The units will be priced for households earning up to 30% of the area median income. Um, for one, a one-person household, that's uh, $25,000. 
These are prefabric prefabricated modular units that are created off site. And they've done that as a way to save money and also time and construction. So the project is set to open sometime in 2023. And Dan, I see your hand up, or was that from earlier? That was from earlier, okay. <laughs> um, the um, VOA, the, the, the work on the, um, the hotel is coming, is coming along. They ran into some problems getting the sign off by the fire department. And there's two different sign offs, one that's by VOA and a different one that's by the city. They're, they're working on that. Uh, once they've straightened all of that out, then they'll be, they've already taken applications and they're continuing to take applications. Um, but once that's all, uh, all taken care of and they're up and running, which they're hoping is fairly soon, then they will invite us to come for a tour, which we had talked about doing. Um, the, the grinder, I don't know if you've driven by, the grinder is gone. The Camel Crow has um, started work on that project that they're now calling Vivo. Vivo on Harbor is what they're calling it. Mm -hmm. um, the Topaz building, which you know has been entitled to be converted primarily uh, all the upper floors into apartments. Um, that has is now in escrow, so we'll see what the new owners do. Um, that's also been, you know, a lot of discussion around using that parking lot, and so that got held up because it was for sale. So maybe maybe something will happen. Um, I have no idea who bought it. The project at 111 North Harbor, which we've never seen, we never were able to get um, presented to us. Um, that's also in escrow. It's currently entitled for 120 units, um, 11 of which are reserved for low-income households. And they are doing some architectural changes. We're trying to find out who the new owner is. Can you go and look again, Rock, and see if you can find out the new owner? Because the one you had was, when you looked last time, appeared to be the old owner. Um, so we can try to get them get them invited in to, to tell us about the project and what the changes they're proposing. Absolutely. Um, the you know last month I didn't have my we were camping and I didn't have my notes so this is actually a, a month old but at a board of harbor commissioner a board of harbor commissioners meeting Mike Galvin gave an update on the PAIP and he said that they are looking at it as an ongoing um, program aligned with the board's capital improvement budget. So you know, it looks like they've made some progress in terms of keeping this as a permanent part of, of what they do. And then he listed four possible future improvements for San Pedro. And this is something Wilmington too, I don't remember, didn't pay attention to those, but four for San Pedro that, that, that they could see coming out of the PAIP. Um, first one was improvements to Harbor Boulevard down to 22nd Street for $11.5 million. The second one was improvements to, to Signal Street all the way down to Altasee for $14 million. The third one was a smart waterfront parking system, which I think is a kind of a phone app that helps you locate parking, but I'm not sure. And that they've estimated at $5 million. And the last one, was the relocation of the USS Iowa down to the area by um, West Harbor that would cost 21 million. So his presentation is on the Northwest planning page under Waterfront Development PIP if anyone wants to, to look at it. Um, and I thought Coastal might be neighborhood, uh, we got anyone with Coastal still on? Alan, <laughs> Doug, oh, there you are, Doug. Um, the port also did what they call the Coastal Resiliency Study. I'm not sure what that is or what that means, but you all may want to invite them to present their findings and the steps that they're now planning to take um, on that. So that was the end of, of that. And all the rest of my pages didn't load for me. <laughs> Hopefully there was nothing else important on there. Um, a couple of questions, Anna. Um, do you have any updates on that um, billboard at the end of um, the freeway on Gaffey? 
Well, I know I mentioned it to Tim and he was well aware of the problem and the timing on it, but I haven't talked to him in the last three weeks, but it's it, the um, lease is up like now. Yeah, I believe it was like uh, December 22nd or so. Yeah. yeah. Siggy is signaling, you probably have more information. Um, yeah, so I've been looking at that billboard for, you know, a couple of years, <laughs> was uh, looking at it for the festival. Um, it's about 10 grand a month. Anyway, I called them up just out of curiosity because, yeah, the last information I, I heard from Biscano's office um, was that uh, the lease was supposed to be at the, you know, at, uh, end at the end of this month, at the end of this year. However, um, they have booked uh, the billboard. I didn't say who I was. I was just asking, you know, as a client. They have booked the billboard up until like February or March, I think it was. So, um, yeah. So they're still taking bookings on that. Hmm. Well, I've noticed that the light is off. So actually right after the date that it was supposed to go off, I have not seen the light on. So I assume... That meant, you know, that it has stopped being used. But um, I think we need to check with um, whoever is. Um, did we have a contact at Councilman's office? Yeah, he uh, left. Yeah, right, and so that was my other question, Diana. Do we have a new contact? Well, we, yeah. we do, but there isn't any staff there yet. <laughs> actually, to, to go actually with. I'm going to jump in because I talked to Tim this afternoon. And Sergio Carrillo, I think, was supposed to be at the meeting tonight. Oh, was and he? I suspect this might have been the reason why. But whatever happened, he's not here. But and, and it's not Sergio is not. He's, he said they're still like figuring out who's going to do what. But it sounded like, you know, he did mention that Sergio was probably coming tonight, but. Obviously, hmm. he didn't. So I'm wondering if that might have been what was going to be discussed. So. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sure they're they're still trying to figure out a lot of things. So. Yeah, um, I would check with Sergio. Though. I'll, I'll 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 give Sergio a call tomorrow. Yeah. Sergio said he's covering planning issues until they get a plan right. yeah. on board, and that's why I'm guessing. And he's covering he everything, and he doesn't really have the. I know. I saw him talk to him about the billboard. Anyway. Oh, Pat, we might need to do it from the car. Mm. Maybe Doug, Doug, do you want to call Sergio tomorrow? Because I'm wearing. Oh, I, I can just shoot him a text. Yeah. 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 We're in transit tomorrow, so it might be hard. Okay. okay. I got to talk um, to him about something else anyway. Yeah. Linda, did you have a comment regarding that? Yeah, quick comment. I just want to thank uh, Diana for every month uh, providing these updates. I printed out the one she did uh, right away. I found that really interesting. And since I don't retain all these figures, it's nice to <laughs> have it in print. Thank you. You're welcome, Linda. Thank you. Um, I also have the map, you know, the, the, the link that shows every, every all the development, but I did that one just to be very specific about what's actually under construction. So. Thank you. Um, okay, we'll move on. Um, last item is uh, public comment on items not on the agenda. Don't see any, but uh, Siggy. Um, I was talking to some friends that live on 14th Street and I know the um, DOT people came and did a presentation. However, everyone is up in arms about um, the bus route getting moved from 13th down 14th both ways. And that's a tiny street with parking on both sides. So I completely understand why they're, um, you know, suddenly their quiet street is now a big thoroughfare. <laughs> so I'm not sure what's happening with that. Hmm. And yeah. you had it on your agenda last night. Say it again. We talked about it last night. It, it is the the stakeholder that reached out to us is in uh, our neighborhood council. It changes at um, at. Uh, the next block up or down the next block east but uh, we'll follow up on it with that immovable object known as metro they may run buses but they don't move 
anything. So <laughs> we'll follow up on it. I, I understand they're upset. And we're also, uh, if, it, if we're in public comment, if I may say so, uh, we're also following up with LAUSD and the traffic department on the need for a cross crossing guard at 7th Street School, which was there for years and as I understand has been removed at a clearly very uh, risky intersection in the morning so and afternoon. So we're following up on that as well. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Pat? All right. It's uh, 7.40 roughly now. I was just want to tell you guys that Diana will uh, probably be about till about 9.30 tonight writing up the minutes of this meeting. And she, <laughs> and she does it after every meeting. I, you know, I, I get to see how hard she works more than uh, anybody else here does, of course, because she's, she's here. So I just wanted to thank her. Oh, definitely. I totally appreciate what you do, Diana. Like I said, I don't know what we would do without your uh, support and help. And we really thank you throughout the year. Uh, you do an excellent job. If we haven't told you that before. Thank you all. <laughs> thank you. Um, Doug. Yeah, I know what I would do. People would say, what's that building over there on 9th? And I go, I don't know. Um, so thank you, Diane. Um, just a quick word on crossing guards in schools. We used to have crossing guards on Pacific Avenue. We used to have crossing guards up by Leland Street School. And the reason all these crossing guards disappeared was A, because they're not paid for by the school district. They were all provided by the city of Los Angeles. Okay. And B, the city puts in a stop sign and says, you don't need a crossing guard anymore because you got a stop sign. And that's why they've disappeared from places like 7th Street School. Hmm. So yeah, I don't know what we're going to do about that one, but I miss the crossing guards on Pacific because I'm up and down that street all the time. And I got to tell you, I wouldn't want to have to be letting my kid cross that street without a guard. Well, I stop, think somebody stop sign or no. Several people have referred to talking to the new councilman, and I suggest we do it quickly before he is absorbed fully into the board. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, uh, you have a, you have a to talk to him once he has some staff that can work on something. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah. waiting for staff to come on board myself. Yeah. Potato, I'll, potato. Uh, you're muted. Alan, Alan, you're muted. <laughs> Alan, we can't hear you. Sounds very interesting, but we can hear you. Oh, okay. there you are. <laughs> okay, be like that. If you're not going to listen, I won't say. <laughs> no, I just want to add uh, additional praise to Diana for, for her support of civic action and to thank all of you. Uh, for your commitment to constructive civic engagement. Uh, we don't solve every issue that comes up, but I think it's very important to have these dialogues. And I want to wish everybody a happy new year and best wishes for the year to come. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. And likewise, um, this is our last meeting for the year and um, mm -hmm. it's been a good year. Um, been through a lot of things and I think we've accomplished a lot of things and, and we're still in a move to do more. So thank you everyone for their for your time and for being at the meetings and then and, and helping us uh, move things along. So thank you and uh, we will see you on January 25th um, for our next meeting. Diana? Yeah, I just want to announce that Northwest will be having a short meeting immediately following this one. So Northwest people, please stay on. We've got two um, action items um, on our agenda. Very well. And the, the meeting on the 25th um, is the zoning, the, the rezoning of San Pedro, um, the application of the new zoning code and how they're going to apply it. And, and I set out and put also put in the agenda pack some information um, that they, on what they're doing in Harbor City and Wilmington, 
And I think it would behoove everyone to listen to that um, video uh, prior to the meeting on the 25th, because I think it'll give you a better, uh, better idea of what they're talking about and it'll make us better prepared to ask the appropriate questions. So I would really encourage people to look at that, to listen to that. Thank you. Thanks, Diana. And so that will do for our meeting tonight uh, for the rest of us and except Northwest, stay tuned. And um, we'll see you next year and uh, happy new year to everyone. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye everyone. Happy new year. With, and with that, I'll start the, the Northwest meeting and call to order the Northwest San Pedro Neighborhood Council. And um, unfortunately, my my notes, my computer ate my notes. So <laughs> I don't know what happened. The first half of my notes came out just fine. The second half, of, my picture isn't working, so I'm having a trouble here. So I'm going to call call the roll by just saying we have um, Diana here. We have Rock. We have Jason. We have Alan. All in friends as a guest. Um, and there's Sergio Carrillo just came on now that we've talked about him in, in the other meeting. And <laughs> um, I think I will um, ask Sergio to say something under public comment in just a minute. And then we have um, Chuck and Craig and Linda and Dan Dixon. And I see Frank Anderson is still on. And we have a call in user. Patty and A E G E O I and Sergio. Okay, so I'm calling to, to order the um, Northwest San Pedro Neighborhood Council Planning and Land Use Committee. It is 735 on Wednesday, December 28th. And I think I'm going to take public comment first. And um, as a part of that, I'm going to call on Sergio to, um, and I have a hand up here. To tell to Sergio. Hello, Sergio. For those of you who haven't met him, Sergio, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Well, hello and good evening, everyone. I apologize for not being on at the earlier meeting. I had my meetings mixed up. I'm, you know, I'm still trying to figure this out here. And so my name is Sergio Carrillo, and I am working in the office of council member. Tim McCosker, I almost said Janice Hahn. Um, <laughs> and I uh, will be handling a few things for now. For now, I am the, I'll, hand, I'll be handling planning and land use issues, as well as economic development issues. We plan to hire a planning and economic development deputy in the, um, in the very near future. But until then, I will be handling some of that stuff. I also will be handling special projects as well as everything port. Um, and so that's what my portfolio will be. But I do want to just say that um, that on behalf of Council Member McCosker, we look forward to, to working with not just your neighborhood council, but all the neighborhood councils in, in the 1-5 and in the harbor area. Um, we look at you as members of our government. Um, that is what he believes. And that is what he will continue to do. As you know, during the campaign, he attended many a neighborhood council meetings because that's what he is. He, when he was the chief deputy city attorney, he helped write the new city charter. When he was chief of staff to the mayor, he helped implement it. And of course that included neighborhood councils. Um, <clears throat> we plan to have um, staff attend all of your neighborhood councils. Um, and the planning deputy will obviously attend, attend the planning and land use committees for the neighborhood councils. Um, but until then, it's me. And so if there's any particular issue that, we, that needs to be addressed urgently in the next few weeks, then that, that would be me. Um, so there is one urgent issue, um, Sergio, and then I see a couple of hands as well. The urgent issue is the billboard at the end of Harbor Freeway, which we were just talking about in the prior meeting. Um, and since you're here, do you know what the status of, yes, of ending that? Absolutely, is? I do. So 
some background for those of you who may not know. I'm sure you all probably do, but speak for we all do. I want to make sure. Um, the city of LA actually purchased that property many years, a few years ago, and we had to do a, a, a lease with uh, with them as part of that uh, purchase. That lease expires on December 31st. They have been informed by the city of Los Angeles' general services department that their lease is gone and they need to be gone by December 31st. Whether or not the actual structure is gone on the 31st or a few days after that, um, we don't know. Uh, but, it, but it is, their lease is done on December 31st, which is Saturday is their last day. Um, I get a feeling that come Monday or Tuesday, they'll still be up there. And then we will begin the, that process that needs to be done as you would with any other eviction, I guess, um, in, the, in, in, that, in that issue. The council member is committed to taking that thing down. Um, as you may or may not know, one of the, on the very first day of office or second day of office, first city council meeting, he introduced um, several motions. One of those was a status update on that billboard. And so um, that is important to him. It's important to you. Therefore, it's important to him. Um, and we're going to take it down as soon as possible. Again, whether that means that they're taking it down on Saturday or Sunday or Monday or next mm -hmm. week, or whether or not we have to take it down and then send them a bill, something will, will happen. But that billboard is coming down relatively soon. Okay, thank you. I see um, a hand from call-in user number two. <clears throat> Whoops. Something happened. I tried to let call in user number two talk. Call in user number two. Number two. Hello. Would you like to identify yourself? Thank you very much. Uh, are we in public comment? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, so, how long do I have for public comment? Two minutes. Is this general public comment? I stand corrected. Yes. Okay. You can start my time now. Um, Once again, uh, where's Dunn? Where's your Dunn rep regarding this meeting? They're nowhere to be found. Do you get do you, did you get permission from Dunn for doing this? Probably not. They're here to hurt everybody. When's the last time a rep on those little parasite pieces of shit ever said thank you to you or great job? They never do. They never do outreach. Their outreach is, I'll get back to you whenever I want. When's the last time you felt supported? Why does Dunn and their piece of shit parasites have to talk for you regarding the city attorney? Even though I'm not a California Bar attorney, your counsel is the client in which you would speak directly to the attorney, not have an intermediary. That means you don't have attorney-client privilege or work product when you have a third party. So you should probably ask Dunn uh, some of these questions and why they continuously uh, belittle, in my opinion, the board members, giving them very vague rules, lack of response, lack of support. So don't know what else to say. I think you put on a pretty good meeting and a pretty good council, but you should ask those pieces of shit over there, what have you done for me? They don't. They don't care. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Pat, did you have something under public comment? Oh, I have I have a question to ask of Sergio on the billboard. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Sergio, there's there's a, a provision in, in California law. Point that, of order, you can't discuss some public comment. I can ask him a question, Craig. You can ask him a question. No, you can't. Mute, would you please mute it's, Craig? It's, no, it's public ask. comment. You can't it's, ask questions. You can ask questions. I thought the last question. you can't ask questions. I period. Thought last, I thought the last uh, the commenter was Greg, given the language that the guy was using. Anyway, uh, there is a, uh, I didn't ask him a question, I'll just uh, pass on the information. Uh, then the, there's a provision in California law that uh, says that if, if the government owns that billboard stuff, even though there's an expired lease on it, you're gonna have to pay them a statutory uh, fee, basically an eminent domain fee to get rid of that billboard. I think the city is aware of that. Thank, Thank you, Pat. So we'll pass that on to Sergio. And you may want to take that with Sergio or, or Tim following this as well. 
Okay. Well, is there any other public comment? Diana, if I may, I, before I leave, I do have to leave and I apologize. Um, I'm in Big Bear. So um, I have to I have my, my cousins here. But I do want to say the council member does appreciate your hard work. We know that you guys don't have to be members of the neighborhood council. We know that you don't have to give up your evenings and your time, but you do, and you do because you care for your community, and we are very appreciative of you. I don't know what the other person was speaking about. I can tell you, your council member, this field, this deputy of his, and our staff truly appreciate the work that you do. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, with that, I'm going to, to move on um, to the next item on our agenda. Um, which is to consider a letter regarding the street trees in the Gappy Greenbelt. Um, so I will put the letter up and then I'll call on Chuck. Oh, whoops, we have one other hand up, I'm sorry. Patty Nagley. Patty, would you like to say something? Oh, oh well, <laughs> I think the letter speaks for itself. Maybe she just oh, has a Hold on, Chuck. There was a, a, a public comment that I missed. So I called on Patty Nagley to give her public comment. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, not really. It's too soft. I'm like really dumb because it's the second time that I've talked to the neighborhood council that I can't be heard. Um, and very frustrating. Um, hi, Linda, Alexander. Um, I, I, I don't know why, Patty, you have such a difficult time. Um, maybe you want to email us? If you want to um, send a text to me, I can read it. Sure, I can do that. No problem. I'll give you a number you can text to. Um, 310-930-0200. And I will go. So what I will do is I will go on to the next item and then I will come back to whatever you have texted us and, and, and read it. Or you can email it to whichever you prefer. Um, so Chuck, go ahead. Well, I, I think the letter speaks for itself, um, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. The only comment I, additional comment I would have, I don't think there's a number of trees that's accurate because I can't walk the line myself. It's impossible driving by or parking and moving to an accurate count, but I think the numbers are somewhere up around the 30, so the trees that need, uh, need, uh, need care in some way, shape or form. Okay, I, we, can, we can review that and make any correction um, prior to the, the board meeting. Craig? Okay, I, I, until recently, I've been walking that strip of uh, a park all the time. The big problem is, is the, the port gave over the care of that, the property to the park uh, and racks, and they're not keeping it up. It's not just the trees. If you start looking back at the plantings, they've died off. Uh, the weeding's held back. Uh, cleaning is not happening on a regular basis. Trash cans are overflowing. Um, you know, if you we- have a, Do you wanna propose an amendment to the letter? I think the letter, the letter's not enough. It's, we need to, needs, to be we need to get we need to talk to the port about them taking over uh, maintenance of the property because the, the park and recs aren't going to do it you know what's going on they want money parks and recs wants money so they're getting money for maintaining this strip and they're not maintaining it because we have problems enough having them maintain the regular parks that we have 
they're getting money to retain it, we need to have a regular schedule of how it's going to be maintained, what is going to be maintained. Um, I think we need to, this letter doesn't show up. It's uh, the the trees the trees along Gaffey aren't cut on a regular basis. That's why you can see uh, and trimmed on a regular basis. That's why you can see the the truck passages uh, tunnels underneath it. Um, they're going to go through this whole process, uh, and the port's going to say, "Well, you know, we're paying this, the parks to do this, and they're not going to do anything." So I think what what we need to do is have the port take ask the port how they're going to take responsibility for this when they put it on, put off maintenance of it to the parks and recs. Yeah. Yeah, there's a question for uh, Craig and for Chuck, uh, both. I mean, what is your information that they pass this on to Rec and Parks? And the reason I ask that is because uh, the Harbor Department has a, a gardening crew that uh, does this kind of work. Uh, and second of all, a number of times I've seen uh, Harbor Department trucks in on the uh, on the strip. So do you have some information that they have passed it on to a reckon park? Yes, we do. Yeah, mm -hmm. they do. And the, I've seen them on repeated things. It used to be yeah. used to be port. It was well maintained. And when they, they passed it on to parks and recs, it went straight downhill. So we um my we have a letter before us. We have we can act on the letter we have and then we can either accept it, reject it, send it. Um, if we accept it, we can still do, and I would ask Craig to write the second letter to outline the concerns that he has raised, or we can, we can wait and ask him to revise this letter. So since we have the letter before us, unless someone has a proposal to amend the letter, uh, I'm going to suggest we take a vote on the letter first. Uh, Dan, can I ask a question? Pat a question? What, what, what can I ask Pat a question, please? Yeah. Pat, in that China shipping lawsuit, the verbiage, I, I can't quote it, obviously, I don't have it in front of me, but it was said that the port had to be held responsible. So isn't the bottom line that the port is still responsible even though they turned it over to Ports and Rec? I mean, Rex and Park? How they contract for uh, maintaining it would be up to them. Uh, so I would think that even with the uh, settlement, even though they have an obligation to maintain their property and so forth, if they wanted to contract it out, they could do that. I, I, I would wondering, uh, Chuck, what you would think of adding um, Rec and Parks as a an addressee on the, on the letter, uh, because it sounds like the failure of administration by Rec and Parks to do their, uh, you know, fulfill their contractual obligations. What do you think of doing that with the, the letter we have so we don't have to write a second one? Thank you. Well, we, can, we can certainly add them as a, as a CC on the letter and maybe we also should CC the city's um, um, arborist because that's part of where this is wound up. I need to clarify the issue. So do we have, a, we have before us a motion for this letter, Pat? Well, send it to Anthony, to, to Perosi too. I mean, he's a commissioner for the, the Harbor Department, for the Board of Harbor Commissioners, and he lives in the neighborhood. So we'll there. send it. So, sure, we could send it to the Board of Harbor Commissioners as well. Yeah. Um, so we have a motion before us for a letter from Chuck. Do we have a second to the motion? I'll second it. I would like to second it. So then we will take a vote on the motion. Rock? Yes. Jason? Yes. Alan Frank? Oh, Alan is, vote, is not a member. Um, Chuck? Yes. Uh, Craig? Yes. Uh, Linda? Yes. Uh, Dan? Yes. And I'll vote yes. So the motion carries unanimously.
Um, now, Craig, you raised another very interesting question. Pat? You didn't call my name, I'll vote yes. Oh, Pat, I didn't call your name. I'm sorry, Pat won't right. yet. You'll hear about it later. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Craig, you raised a number of interesting issues regarding the Beckham Parks um, maintenance. I'd love to suggest that you draft a letter outlining that and that we can consider that um, at a future meeting. So, when you, if you I, I'll probably write up and make it as an amendment to this okay. for the board meeting. Sure. It's easier than to reconsider it at one time. It's, it's not. I mean, if you go down there, I, I suggest that everybody at one time or another take a walk down there because this is a big project that's going to be happening. Um, it was a really nice, well-maintained uh, park, and it's just gone downhill um, since the change has happened. So um, if any of you can see it if if you'd walk around the path. Um, do I have time to discuss this, Aunt well, Diana? Well, I think I think you've made your your point, and I think most of us have seen what you're talking about. So okay, um, then I'll just drop it. But I would I would suggest that you, if you want to do that as an amendment at the board, that you you know that you develop that and then bring it to the board um, as an amendment. So oh, come on. Um, uh -huh. I want to thank Craig and public Chad comment for this for their for their uh, work on this. Yeah. Yes. Public comment. Uh, may I speak, ma'am? Yes, you should. Yes, you may. Okay. You, I'm not going to penalize, but you're supposed to do public comment before the vote. No, uh, that's right. We were supposed to. You're right. Okay, ma'am. Ma'am, I'm not not holding that against you. Uh, the problem with the letter when you do legislative drafting. Uh, the letter fails to identify, or is actually doesn't fail. It, it's silent regarding the fiscal and the authority from one department to transfer to another. Uh, that is part of the foundation, and uh, I am just afraid that you're going to be uh, uh, silent on what is, I think, meritless. It has merit and needs to be addressed. But uh, that's up to this neighborhood council, not to me. And as to the individual that, uh, that stated uh, you're not allowed to comment, I use citations, and I'm very good at that. I suggest you look under Government Code 54954.2, subsection uh, A3. It says explicitly and expresses uh, that any person could request a response posed to the public or initiative and ask and the staff or the legislative body could ask for clarification or make a brief announcement or brief report regarding that. So that's completely uh, plausible. I'm not going to give the uh, Court of Appeal decisions on that, which I was part of one, but uh, you are correct. And if anybody uh, wants to cite otherwise, I give them the pleasure. Thank you, madam. No, thank you. And yes, we understand. Some of us like to understand that that's that's the law. Um, okay, the next item um, has to do with allocation of funds for a, a beautification project um, at Peck Park. There, the agenda item says consider recommending five hundred dollars from Northwest San Pedro for planting at Peck Park, but actually we're going to consider possibly a, a larger amount, which I'll discuss in a minute. There's a group of us that have been meeting regarding improvements needed to the Peck Park Canyon. And we've identified the need for planting the slopes near the entrance to the Ray Patricio Trails, the entrance that is located at Elberon and Walker. And Alan Franz has developed a list of native plants that once planted there should need little to no care. The proposed planting would be done by volunteers. The plants would come from the Palos Verdes Land Conservancy's nursery here in San Pedro. So they would all be native plants. Now, um, initial watering to get them established would be done by the neighbors who live along that portion of the canyon. Not only would the plants help to beautify this entrance to the canyon, but they would also help to stabilize the slope and to provide wildlife habitat. 
due to the gophers in the area, there would also need to be some chicken wire purchased to protect the roots. So the total estimated cost is $765, $744 for the plants and about $21 for the chicken wire. And I had originally planned to recommend $500 dollars from the neighborhood council and then ask recreation parks and maybe some of the neighbors to see if they would contribute. However, when I discussed all this with, with our treasurer, Melanie, she has suggested that we ask for the full $765. She says, if the money's there, you know, guys ought to ask for it. So I am revising my, my recommended motion. She's also recommended that it be done as a neighborhood purchase grant, a neighborhood purpose grant. Um, the city has put, our, our, call, our calling caller will love this comment, the city has put so many restrictions and requirements around beautification grants that it's just easier to do it as a neighborhood purpose grant. So I would like to move that the um, Northwest San Pedro Neighborhood Council allocate uh, $765 for a neighborhood purpose grant to the Palos Verdes Land Conservancy for plants um, for Peck Park Canyon. So that's the motion. Uh, I'll second it. Who, who, who said they second it? Was that Rock? Yep. Rock. Okay. I beat you, Dan. Yes, you did. <laughs> and Alan, I was ready to jump in, too. <laughs> oh, great. Alan's here to answer any questions. I see uh, Craig's hand. Craig? Okay. Who are we allocating the money to? The Palos Verdes Land Conservancy. So yes. we're by we're we're by who's doing the the problem comes with you know when you're when you're trying to allocate money is they you just can't you know give money to cal, to the to the land agency usually it has to go to the park and recs or something else so no uh, actually, that needs to be clarified oh no, actually i clarified it with our treasurer who said please do not give it to park and recs give it to a nonprofit. and since the plants were going to be purchased anyway from the land conservancy and they are a nonprofit, it made the most sense to just give to just directly give them the money for the plants so, yeah, I understand, but that is, that are they, do we have an agreement with them that they will give us, they will give the plants? That would be part of the agreement, obviously, yes. That's in the neighborhood purpose grant, that would be the agreement. That's what the grant would be for specifically. Because grants, they don't have to use the grant, they don't have to use. That's one of the problems with grants is they don't have to use the money for what you give it to them for. It's a grant. Alan, would you like to say anything? Sure, if I may. Um, as it's been summarized, it, it is a, a, a brief overview of the project in mind, but we have a plant list that specifies how many of which species of plants we have uh, an agreement with the administration of Peck Park, who has visited the site with us on several of several occasions. So a, every dollar that Diana is, is proposing uh, would go to uh, materials, not to staffing or anything else, but to acquisition of plants and of, as she said, chicken wire or, or some wire mesh to deter gophers from eating up the plants as we install them. Uh, so it's it's not a, a, a simply open-ended grant where anybody could do anything they wanted once they got their hands on the money. It's it's pretty clearly specified. Uh, does that clarify the nature of, of the request, Craig? That's you, you don't. It, it's a grant. In other words, you can't. You can specify you want, they can use the money however they want. <laughs> it, it just doesn't work that way. Yeah. Um, but, you know, hopefully, I mean, I would feel more comfortable if we, if like we did something with the Boy Scouts and they did the planning and we gave a grant to the Boy Scouts, that sort of thing. Well, the, the Boy Scouts would still need to acquire the plants. And that's what yeah no but you, you, don't, you don't 
I understand what I'm trying to say is if if there was a like the Boy Scouts, you know, they do these projects for um, the Eagle Scout or whatever, and they they do this stuff. If they were to do it and we were to give them the money, this was their thing. Um, you know, I would be I would feel more comfortable with it. I think it would go through quicker and easier um, because okay. that's I know how they put put these grants because okay, they, um, the grant was put together by members of the neighborhood council and the neighborhood, uh, not by the land conservancy, who other than me doesn't know anything about it. I that's the point. <laughs> You know, yeah. they, we could give the bounty to the land conservancy and they can just take it and put it into their general mm -hmm. funds. It's no, they can't. Yeah, they can. No, it's a grant. No, they can't. We have two hands up. Um, I'm going to call on Linda and then I'll call on Pat. Linda. OK, so that so maybe things have changed, um, Greg, but uh, you stipulate in the grant exactly what the money is to be used for. For and uh, woe, woe to the one who doesn't do that. Um, I, I don't understand. Well, we don't have to discuss it more. Uh, I think uh, I'm certainly um, approve of this uh, idea of going through the uh, Peninsula Land Conservancy. And I assume in the grant, it's something about supervising um, the volunteers who will be doing the planting. As I understood it when I read, read through it today, that uh, your planning is, is essentially all volunteers doing the planting. Which might include Boy Scouts. We, we have, I think the intention to at some point involve high school students, and perhaps students at other levels. Right. And, and Alan will supervise the planting. So. Yeah. I've been called a boy what scout. An, what, an, what an amazing list of plants. <laughs> <laughs> Pat I Nave. saved it. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Pat Nave? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I look at this and, and look kind of like a purchase order. You're saying, hey, these are the plants we're going to buy, and here's how much we're, we're allocating uh, to pay for them. Is that is that what we're doing here, Alan? Essentially, I, I don't think the chicken wire is. Uh, uh, specified in, in terms of the cost, but uh, it is basically the, the cost of acquisition of the plants that are listed. And I, I haven't had a chance to, to review. I don't, I don't know where I heard it, but I think, I think uh, somebody suggested, it might've been Melanie, that, that instead of 500, you say 800, and you, you said 770 or something. Well, like I just that. added 21 for the chicken wire. Yeah, we didn't need 800, so yeah, she said, Ask for eight hundred. I thought, well, we've got <laughs> we've got a list that says seven forty four. We've got the chicken wire, and so that I just put it I, together. I think if I think if somebody wants to to uh, kill the deal and and uh, delay it, and so it's, it, then they should just vote against it and bring it up at the at the board meeting and and uh, try to get the commissioner, or the council, to, to do something else. Can we call a question. Call question you know? <laughs> okay, so we have a motion before us for seven hundred and something dollars uh, for the, to go to the Land Conservancy as a part of an MPG, and they would have to fill out a, a, an application, which we have not done. But this gets to money allocated. Um, Rock. Yes. Uh, Jason. Yes. Um, Chuck. Yes. Craig. No. Linda? Yes. Dan? Yes, please. Pat? Aye. And I vote yes. So motion carries one, two, three, four, five, six. No public comment. Seven yes and one no. Yes. Okay, public comment. After the vote, thank you. <laughs> you know, I didn't see a hand or I would have called on you. I'm I'm not blaming you. You're all you're you're you know. bench. Thank you. Okay, uh, two minutes. Uh, Mr. Craig is actually most appropriate. You have to have an application in front of you for your response. And you're dealing with fiscal and representation. One thing that I always check on conservatives, on, on any applicant, 
is if their corporate papers are in order, because you'll be amazed on how many of them have been suspended or even forfeited corporations. And even though they show the determination letter from the IRS, you'll be amazed when I pulled it from the IRS website where their determination letter has been withdrawn. So um, you, you can only respond through an MPG. You're doing something the cart before the horse, so I would have to agree with Mr. Gregg full-heartedly. I'm not saying that you're trying to be nefarious or hideous. The, the issue is there has to be a process, and um, based on representations that have been made to you, that might not be the other person's understanding. So uh, you have to make sure not only the fiscal is done right, but they have the logistics to fulfill that uh, fiscal uh, grant and actually come back and report. So it's up to you what you want to do or not want to do. Thank you. Alan, did you want to say something? Yeah, if I may comment on that. I, I agree to a certain extent that we should have an NPG grant uh, completed before finalizing this. And obviously, no money is going to change hands until there is a proper formal agreement. Uh, the, the, the reason this came in the form it did today was Diana had originally asked for a different format uh, to obtain the grant and was uh, had it explained to her by Melanie that the NPG was a more effective vehicle or more appropriate for this circumstance. Uh, as regards the Land Conservancy, it's an organization that's been uh, chartered in the state of California for over 30 years. We get uh, substantial sums of money from the uh, federal government, from the state, from the county, and uh, we do a lot of work with the cities of Rancho Palos Verdes and Rolling Hills and Palos Verdes estates. Uh, we're not a fly-by-night organization. We have a native plant nursery in San Northwest San Pedro on the fuel DFSP, the fuel depot site. And we manage the uh, White Point Nature Preserve and Nature Education Center. We have third grade education programs at all the elementary schools in San Pedro and have indeed received grants from all three neighborhood councils to support these programs. So I, I hope you are persuaded that it's a legitimate organization and that uh, when a, a proper NPG grant is developed and submitted, uh, it will uh, indeed be an effective mechanism for carrying out the intent of the proposal that Diana has brought forward. Yeah, it is. It is. Nothing would happen without that application being submitted, but Melanie wanted us to go ahead and allocate the funds now. She wants to consider it at her budget committee to allocate the funds, and then um, we would still need to bring forward the application. So I would like to move on um, to the next item. I, I just wanted to say that the, the only reason my, I voted against this was I don't think it's a pro, it was appropriately done and you're putting the cart before the horse. I, and it, I don't think it would have a, make a difference in the allocations of a budget or money since we already have the money there. Um, and the, I'm, just, I'm just taking my guidance from our treasurer. So, and so we'll see what happens. But, but thank you for your explanation. Um, the last item was um, the um, Peck Park Canyon update. I just wanted to let everyone know we now have regular volunteer-led exercise walks in Peck Park Canyon at 9 a.m. on the third Wednesday of every month. There's also a exercise walk planned for Sunday, January 8th at 9 a.m. to see how if people like doing a Sunday walk. And then our Alan Franz is going to be leading a nature walk starting on the fourth Saturday of every month at 9 a.m. Uh, the nature walk will be suitable for families, and all of the walks leave from the trailhead in the lower parking lot at Peck Park. And then we're jump-starting the beautification project we just talked about a minute ago. We're actually jump-starting it because Alan has donated some sagebrush and lupin seeds, some of which have already been planted, and the rest of which we are hoping to finish planting this next Thursday morning if it's not raining. So if anyone wants to help plant, let me know. Are you um, talking about also, tomorrow? What? 
Tomorrow is the next Thursday. Is that what you're talking about? No, the following Thursday. I'm sorry. Yeah, not yeah, tomorrow. That's next Thursday. Thursday's yeah. Thursday. I mean, there's <laughs> next Thursday. It's supposed to be. The first rain Thursday of the year. Oh, vacation, Linda. Huh? So exciting, rain. Yeah. So um, if anyone wants to help, let me know. And then the other thing we are discussing with recreation parks is the need to replace the ruined diverters that um, evidently the, the rains, and uh, gently we went and saw it, the rains did significant damage to the trails. So when Deanne gets back in town next week, um, I will be talking to her about that. And that, I believe, because we did public comment at the beginning, I believe that concludes our agenda. Um, our next- no, no. Comment. You already did your public comment. That was regarding the other. Okay, no problem. Thank you very much. You have a very good night, and I like how you run your council. I wish uh, other councils would do the same thing as you do. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, our next joint meeting is, is Wednesday, January 25th. The next Northwest Committee meeting, um, if we need one, would be January 11th. Right now, I don't see a need for it, um, but if if something changes, then we would have then where loans is our next meeting. So I thank you all for being here for the special meeting. And um, Happy New Year. Chuck? So is, is it proper? To, can I ask if we put an item on the agenda for next meeting? To put for, for what? Put a, an item on the agenda for next meeting? Yeah. Yeah. What's the item? Maybe the uh, dying trees on Westmont Drive. Between Kathy Street and you know, should that go on this agenda, or should it maybe go on the um, on the quality of life, the um, issues committee agenda? I'm sorry, I don't understand. Diana. I, I'm thinking that probably belongs on the issues committee agenda rather than this one. Chuck, okay. write it up for me as an agenda item for our next meeting. Okay. All right, with you, Chuck. If you do it to that committee. Yes, he's on the committee. Yeah, no, I'm saying is it all right, Jeff, to take it to that committee rather than this one? Okay. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Chuck. Thank well, you, Diana. Have a happy new year, everyone. And happy new we'll year. See you again in the new year. Great. Thank you all. Peace. Happy new year. <laughs> Enjoy your travels. Thanks. Good night. Well, don't Good go night. to the airport. Great. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank goodness. <laughs> no one's flying anywhere. Well, not on Southwest, that's for sure. <laughs> 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 <laughs>